Hi there, everyone. Thanks so much for having me at the conference today. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be involved with such an extraordinary group of people. Um, my name is Max Williamson. I'm a patient representative from the UK. Um, and today I'm going to be talking as part of the panel discussion, a multifaceted approach to patient engagement in paediatric clinical research. Um, mostly discussing my view as a patient and the work I've done as a patient advocate within research groups, particularly within teenager and young adult cancer care, um, to help ensure that the research is, research is best done for young people and how we can best involve young people in that research as well. I thought to give a little kind of introduction to my story and then talk about how my work in the UK um, has helped to influence some of the um, projects that we've been producing as part of groups like the National Cancer Research Institute um, and the National Institute for Health Research as well. So I was diagnosed with testicular cancer at age 15. Um, my story is, uh, with, with every passing year, it kind of um, it evolves and, and, and changes uh, looking back. But actually thinking about the time, it was a time of a lot of change um, for myself, uh, just in terms of you know, things like puberty, but also social change. Um, and at that time, I wasn't sure what was going to be happening to my body anyway. Um, and so to discover a lump at 14, 15 was difficult. Um, it was my first kind of, uh, my first thought, my first inclination when I first found something was cancer. Um, we'd had a presentation on it a couple of weeks before um, as part of the school's health and safety um, kind of curriculum. Um, and I did then just put it immediately to the back of my mind and said, no, it can't be me. That definitely wouldn't happen to someone my age. I kept an eye on it, kept monitoring it, and actually about six months went by before I mentioned it to anyone. Um, and I then, yeah, mentioned it to my mum. It was a quite scary couple of weeks, but we were waiting for our diagnosis. And then in November 2012, I got diagnosed with testicular cancer. Um, I had one surgery immediately um, to remove the first tumour, and then it was a kind of wait and watch process to see if anything would come back. And unfortunately, um, my cancer did relapse. I um, had a spread to my lymph nodes that we didn't know about. Um, and it spread to the, the lymph nodes in my back. So I had three months of chemotherapy. Um, and it seemed as though for all the markers that chemotherapy was working just as it needed to be. Um, it was a tough experience and it left me with a lot of pain. But ultimately at that time, I was just glad that it was seemed to be working. Um, and then unfortunately, we got news when I had my scan after I finished my chemotherapy that actually despite all the blood markers coming down and um, the tumour it's actually gotten bigger uh, and it continued to grow. I was diagnosed with something called growing teratoma syndrome um, and my testicular cancer was a germ cell tumour um, so a tumour arising from the cells that go on to make um, sperm um, and this means it has a lot of developmental potential that can, can become anything. And what had happened to my cancer was that it had gone from something malignant to something benign, a teratoma, um, which was good. It means that it wasn't going to spread anytime soon, but equally it was something that we needed to take out just in case it did turn back into cancer. So I then had a much larger operation, a full laparotomy to cut me up and take this uh, tumour out of out my back, basically. Um, and that left me with a lot of long-term and effects. So that operation in itself um, was fertility, redu fertility reducing, and I now can't have children biologically. I was lucky that I could sperm back before I, um, before I had chemotherapy, but nevertheless, it was a difficult, difficult thing to hear. My hearing got worse because of my chemotherapy. Um, and also, I think something that we don't acknowledge well enough in, in kind of young people's disease is the effects on psychological self and, and body image and um, it really changed the way I looked at myself and I had to kind of discover a new self that was happy with the way I looked and that was happy with my own response to finding this lump and response to the chemotherapy I had and all those kinds of pressures along which along with the kind of ordinary pressures that being a teenager brings was obviously very difficult. But now I'm a, I'm a patient advocate and I've been an advocate on research groups for the last five years, been very lucky to have that role. Um, and I'm also a medical student as well. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of tackle the issue from, from two sides of the fence. My advocacy work started in 2016 um, and I was really lucky to be invited to apply for a role within the National Cancer Research Institute, which is a kind of group in the UK, which is a 
um, conglomeration of lots of different charity funders, um, all in one kind of sector to help put together research outputs for the entire country on all kinds of cancer. Um, my involvement as a patient was as a young person contributing to the teenage and young adult, teenage and young adult cancer um, clinical studies group, as it was at the time. Um, and initially, I wasn't really sure what I was applying for. Um, I got told by one of my consultants really kindly that like, he, he thought I would be good for the role and I applied, got very lucky in it and got in. Um, but actually, if I look back on it, I wasn't really sure what the job entailed. Um, I thought I'd be able to contribute and give back and, and kind of provide some kind of steering towards where the group should be going, but I wasn't really sure. And, and in the end, I, what, what I'm thankful for was that um, I received a huge amount of mentorship and support within the group, and that allowed me to develop my advocacy work and my skills so that I could then actually advocate properly for young people across the UK. Um, I do it for a lot of reasons, that primary one being giving back to this community. They, you know, they saved my life and I can't, I can't really ever repay that debt. Um, but I feel as though this kind of work is at least going some way to understanding how I can kind of contribute back and, and return that favour. Um, I really love participating in research. I was part of a research study when I was sick uh, and I find research to be a really powerful and empowering um, part of the work we do in healthcare um, for patients just because it allows people to say, well, okay, this experience wasn't perfect. Let's try and define what it was that wasn't perfect about that experience and, and trying to try to improve it. Not so it would necessarily be perfect because it never could be, but so that it could be better than it was before for other young people facing the, facing the same issue. I think it's something for me that's underemphasized for young people's advocacy work is that it's really important for self-growth and career development. It's given me a huge amount of skills in terms of public speaking, conflict resolution, um, interpersonal work, business professionalism and that kind of thing that's actually been really, really useful for the way I kind of direct myself as a young person. Um, and it meant that I felt, at least in some sense, all of this time I missed at school, for example, um, has in a way been caught back up because I've allowed I've been allowed to have those opportunities to grow where perhaps whilst I was stuck at home having chemo, um, I wouldn't have had those opportunities to grow socially when I was that age. And, and lastly, I think empowerment is a really important factor too. Being listened to is a really important part of the care that we should be providing for any patient. Um, but fundamentally, like if you if the choice the choice was for me, for example, in that second operation, we have the operation or we don't have it, and I risk getting really sick again. Um, and it's not really a choice, it doesn't feel very empowering. It's the nature of what we do, it's the nature of medicine, but it is, it's not there to make me feel as if I actually have direction or, or have control over the situation. Now, with patient advocacy work, one of the really kind of delightful things about it is that it can then say, okay, well, you know, you've had this choice taken away from you. How can we best empower you to ensure that the care we provide is better? Um, and it, for me, at least, it's a really cathartic experience because, it, I mean, I, I went from being from feeling as though I was never really listened to, although I was, the kind of feeling of kind of powerlessness was um, was tricky. Um, and actually now I feel as though I can play an equal part along with researchers and clinicians and healthcare professionals to then decide how care is going to be improved in the future. And that is a really, really, really powerful thing, I think, especially for young people who've been, who've been chronically ill. Um, so now we're working with multiple groups and I thought I'd just go through a couple of those to illustrate what, what patient advocacy is doing in the UK and how we can best involve young people in healthcare research. So um, I thought I'd give three examples of some work within the cancer community that I'm, I've been involved with that have really illustrated how powerful young people's involvement can be in terms of changing the research agenda. And the first one for me is the James Wood Alliance project. The James Wood Alliance um, kind of group was set up um, nearly a decade ago now. Um, as part of Cochrane and it's designed to um, help facilitate priority setting in research environments and that means taking healthcare researchers, taking patients, taking practitioners, taking clinicians, grouping them all together and saying okay well this, in this particular field what actually are the top 10 top 30 questions that we, want, we might want to ask for the next 10 or 20 years in terms of research. When this project's over what questions would we like to have answered? Um, and so we did this project back in, it started in 2016, um, just as I was getting involved. Sorry, so just before I was getting involved and I joined a little bit later. Um, and it was Teenage and Adult Cancer Priority Setting Partnership. Um, and I was really lucky to be involved with the steering group along with 
uh, for other young people. Um, the project itself was quite simple. We sent out a survey to pretty much everyone we could find who was working with or was involved with the teenage young adult cancer community. Um, we got about 800 responses back and then we took those responses, took similar ones and merged them together, took questions that were important to the steering group at and together and said, okay, well, what actually is being represented here? What questions are we really trying to develop? And then we took those 800, we then condensed them all down, sent them back out, had responses and we sent them back in. And then finally on the last day back in 2018, we went from those about 50 questions now condensed to the top 10 research priorities. Um, you can see them on the left here, they're a little bit small, but for example, they changed the research agenda from being what was a very clinically focused research strategy beforehand, to something that was much more focused on holistic care. Top, the top question is on what psychological support package improves psychological well-being, social functioning, and mental health during and after treatment. And that question is up there because young people said it was the most important part of the care they received. Now, it's not essential to say that because the young people were there, that wouldn't have appeared. But those young, but the young people that I was involved with were like demonstrably the key to that question being the top in the, in the research categories. And it was really brilliant to be listened to in that process. It was incredibly democratic. Equally, we had to make concessions in terms of what we wanted to be on the board versus what other groups did. Um, and it was a really important and valuable process. And I would recommend to anyone listening today um, to look up the James London Alliance and see if there's a, a project out there in your current field. If, there's, if there is one, um, great. If not, uh, maybe think about getting one together because it's a fantastic piece of work. Secondly, I thought I'd talk about Brightlight. That's a project that's going on in the UK and that's trying to understand how cancer services are really improving outcomes for young people. Back in 2005, the NHS um, kind of long-term plan was part of that plan was to say that we want to develop specific healthcare centres for young people as opposed to children or adults um, who are going through cancer. And so the um, Teenage Cancer Trust and others helped set up teenage specific wards for cancer care um, in hospitals around the country. And this study is essentially just asking the question, are these actually helpful? Do these actually help young people in terms of understanding their illness, both on a kind of physical basis in terms of their outcomes, but also things like monetary stuff, you know, they might have to travel further to get to these teenage and other centres. Are they spending more money to get here on travel, travel costs, that kind of thing. And then also peer support and mental health as well. Um, and integral to that study, integral to the Brightlight study, um, is a focus on allowing young people to help decide the research strategy. Um, so teenagers and adults who experience cancer help lead the research questions in terms of what, what the study was going to be asking. And ultimately, the, the study was asking what's actually important to them in terms of what outcomes are measured. Um, and it's about identifying those holistic things that allow kind of the health service to work. And I'm encouraging them working on, for example, clinical trials at the moment, where the focus is entirely on outcomes that are physical or medical, um, to think about how they might be able to involve more holistic outcomes in terms of the patient experience in their work as well. Um, it's a hugely important part of the way that clinical trials are received by patients, not just young people, but entirely in the, in the cross the population. And I think part of the reason why we need to get better is that because we need to involve more people generally in clinical trials. I think there's a, there's a question that we're always trying to answer in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think actually one of the things we need to get better at is understanding why it is that people do or do not want to take part. And I think the Bright Light study, whilst not a clinical trial, is a really key example of how we can do this for young people in terms of actually having empowering and inclusive research. Lastly, the Fair Trials Group. And this group is a, is a brilliant, um, brilliant group that you would have heard about in the conference before. And it's about um, changing policy and culture um, to allow all young people with cancer to access research. And currently, most clinical trials have an age limit, either in paediatric clinical trials that have an upper age limit, maybe 16 or 18, and then in adult clinical trials for cancer, it will usually be 18 or 16. Um, and this means that there's often a gap between, for the very rare cases where adult cancers might arise in a very young person, or paediatric cancers might arise quite late in a more kind of young adult um, patient, um, those patients are being missed. And that means that occasionally, patients aren't allowed to enter trials that they would otherwise be totally, totally clinically valid for. Um, and trying to recognise that overlap and, and trying to kind of get rid of this um, partition across the teenager spectrum um, is a really important part of the work we do. So currently, young people like myself and, and Marianne, who's also on the group, but also pa parent representatives like Chris Copeland are really, really important in, in terms of developing the group strategy and, and sharing the group and trying to understand how we can best improve um, this 
area of regulation, an area of kind of uh, pharmaceutical expertise that allows every young person who's relevant for a clinical trial who has cancer to be on that trial rather than being barred because they might not have had a certain number of birthdays. So it's a really important part of the group. And I something I recognize that as well as doing all the clinical work that James and the Alliance and the Bright Lights that he might do, there's also a lot of policy engagement and involvement that young people can do that I would encourage anyone to who's working in that field to think about how we can do better in terms of allowing young people to get involved with. So where next for me, I think the most important thing is about understanding how we can improve um, young people's access to involvement and in research. Um, Ultimately, at the moment, I think we still function in, in a lot of groups, especially um, more national or um, wider groups, on a certain number of voices. And I certainly am one of those voices. Um, those voices tend to be people with a lot of social capital. They tend to be people with a lot of political or kind of, uh, sorry, a lot of kind of economic wealth um, and educational background that allows them uh, maybe to enter a research environment more comfortably. And it means that actually we're excluding the vast, vast majority of the population. Um, it's particularly difficult for young people because I think for young people who are deciding, you know, where they want to be and what, what career they want to choose, having a commitment to engage, engagement and involvement that often will take place during the working day is really tough. And it's not easy to try and find how to try and find ways of um, making sure that all these systems work for everyone. I mean, currently the majority of my work in terms of patient engagement work. Um, is with people who are retired because they have the time and that's fair um, but it's just as a recognition that actually that model isn't necessarily what's working and what would, might work better is broad and democratic panels that have a lot of flexibility inbuilt because they've got lots of people to be involved rather than relying on a similar number of voices I'm, I'm I can only go so far in terms of the representation the representation I do and I try to represent the community and try and engage the community but ultimately I'm just one voice and I'm not going to be doing a perfect job. So making sure that it's more broad and democratic, I think, is a real key in terms of understanding how we do this work better. For me, that thing means things like online involvement and engagement rather than um, relying on interpersonal or uh, personal connections to be able to develop this kind of work. So developing panels and developing kind of registers, maybe, of, of young people who are happy to get involved with this kind of work is a really key part of that. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just really important to think about how we can involve young people more broadly, um, in, in particular in terms of policy design. Um, currently, I think what we're really good at, especially in the UK, in terms of involving young people with groups like Generation R, um, are local groups that are often based within a single focus of a hospital and trying to understand how the hospital trust can better improve care for young people. That is essential and really important work, but I'd love to see how that kind of work can be translated to wider groups like the National Cancer Research Institute or the National Boards and Conferences that we're on today. I think it'd be really important to see how those groups and models work um, and trying to take those kinds of panels and saying, okay, well, let's, let's use that kind of work again um, to understand how we can best improve national policy or international policy. How can we do this in a really collaborative and discursive way rather than not relying on the models that current we currently use which are you know that which work and they do greatly but um definitely need a lot of improvement in terms of understanding how we can best involve everyone across the research community rather than just a select few voices so that's everything from me thank you so much for listening i really appreciate your time um and thanks so much for the presentation at satara today um, i hope you'll enjoy the conference um, and have a wonderful week